Afternoon, folks. Really? That's all you got? That's it. I came all the way from Melbourne, Australia, and that's all you got. Unbelievable. Stacey, we need to talk. Uh, my name's M. Campbell Pretty. Uh, I am a founder of uh, Pretty Agile and a safe fellow, whatever that means. Uh, for those who tweet, um, I'm at Pretty Agile. Feel free to tweet it away. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about what it means to take a culture first approach to transforming your enterprise. So us Agile folks like to talk a lot about culture, we like to talk a lot about culture at the team level. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about culture beyond the team level. So, huh. yes, oh, back, back, back. <laughs> so, a little bit of, um, a little bit of a trip back in time. So I think it was around 2010, 2011. I was the business sponsor of a um, large program of work at a large telco in Australia. Uh, we were building an enterprise data warehouse and the technology team that was responsible for delivering this enterprise data warehouse uh, wasn't actually very good at delivering anything. Uh, so, essentially, the way this would work is business sponsor gave money to technology, technology lit a match, set it on fire, came back, asked for more money. <laughs> so, we did that for a little while. Um, this uh, particular group was uh, fondly referred to by uh, one of the executive directors as the worst IT group in the company. Isn't it charming? That wasn't the worst bit. That wasn't the worst bit. The worst bit was actually the culture. The word people used to describe this culture was toxic. This is not dramatic effect. This is literally the word that people used when they would visit the department, then leave, someone would say, what did you think? And they would say, oh my God, the culture in that place is toxic. So for my sins, I assume, somehow I end up the, um, the general manager of this technology group. Uh, I'm sure you find it hard to believe that they couldn't find any qualified technical person willing to take on the job of leading this group. So they went and found the business sponsor was probably the only person who cared about the group and said, you should take this over. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, at this point in time, when we went to market to hire new people, new project manager or what have you, the um, recruitment folks would do their thing and they'd talk to someone and um, you know, get them a bit interested and said, okay, we want to put you forward to, to the company. Uh, here's the name of the company and the department. And people would say, I don't need a job that badly. <laughs> so um, I went on an uh, interesting journey there uh, over, a, over a couple of years. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a taste of what it looked like a couple of years later. <laughs> So um, that is what it looks like when an enterprise data warehouse team does the Macarena, just in case you're curious. Um, for the record, this was not my idea. There was a uh, competition in the company. You could dress up in corporate colours and take cool photos and win a $500 gift voucher, and they desperately needed a PlayStation, apparently. Um, <laughs> so um, the Macarena was their entry into the competition. So um, that particular day got me really thinking about the journey that we had been on. And I was chatting to, to one of my team afterwards. And he says, you know, we're kind of like a tribe. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I really like the community feel that word had. 
So I started reading about tribes. And I came across David Logan's tribal leadership. And David says, essentially, tribe is what people do. So humans, we like to tribe. Birds flock, fish school, people tribe. Just what we do. We like to be in groups of 150 people. No bigger than 150 people. Um, when we get into groups of bigger than 150 people, we just subdivide into smaller groups. It's just the way we are. And they can trace that back through human, human history. Uh, hunter and gatherer societies, uh, all the way to agile release trains, 150 people. <laughs> So um, David Logan and his team did a 10-year study, uh, spoke to about 24,000 people, uh, looking at cultures in organisations. And his view is what makes some tribes more effective than others is their culture. His um, study looked at the language that people use in organisations when, when different cultures are, are present. So he breaks it into five stages where stage one is essentially the cultures of um, prisons and street gangs. Life sucks. This is the language these people use. Only prevalent about 2% of the population. Stage two, my life sucks. Um, <laughs> David Logan refers to this as the culture of the DMV. Um, sorry, anyone works for DMV? Oops. Um, <laughs> prevalent in about, um, I don't know, mid-20s, mid 20, 24, something like that, percent of the population. Um, stage three, stage three. I'm great, you're not. Um, this is a culture of um, doctors, lawyers, um, things of that nature. Don't so many doctors or lawyers in the house either, do we? Okay, it's going well. Um, <laughs> this is actually the most prevalent culture in organisations, about 49% of the population. Stage four, we're great, you're not. This is the culture of sporting teams, right? This is the culture of teams that, sporting rivalries, teams that do great things, essentially. About 20, 22%, something like that, population. Um, and stage five, stage five, life is great. So Logan says that stage five is not actually sustainable. Uh, so organisations tend to bounce from four to five. Uh, but stage five is what you see in organisations that are curing cancer um, and things of that nature. Their um, we're great and you're not lens is you know, we're awesome people fighting cancer, and cancer is evil. So, we understand a little bit now about what various cultures look like. And we know that some tribes are going to be more effective than others because of their culture. What we don't know is how do we get from toxic to Macarena dancing in two years or less. Um, I like uh, Seth Godin's definition of tribe. Tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, and connected to an idea. And I've used this frame when I started to think about what it meant to create an awesome tribe. So we're going to step through this and start with the idea of connecting people to one another. Create awesome teams. It all starts with teams. So if you want an awesome tribe, you want a group of 150 people who are awesome, you actually need awesome teams. Doesn't work without awesome teams. So awesome teams have a shared mission. Everybody is rowing in the same direction, hopefully. Shared mission. Shared reason for being. They're small. They're small. So, seven plus or minus two. 
because quite simply, large teams can't communicate. Small teams can communicate. They can get stuff done. Now, small teams all sounds rather academic, really, doesn't it? And you know, I'm going to say small, mission-capable teams. Some of you might be hearing feature team. It's not easy, right? Mission-capable team, nine people or less, scrum master, product owner included. It's getting tight. It's getting tight. So, while this is ideal, it's good to be pragmatic. So you can always start where you are. It might be kind of componentized, something like that. And over time, move towards a more feature team style view. Team capable of delivering on a mission end to end. How do we get, how do we get to these teams? Um, Harvard, uh, Harvard professor Richard Hackman wrote a number of books um, on collaborative intelligence and others uh, leading teams. Uh, so a lot of his research is about how do you, how do you create great teams. And um, he has a lot to say about the things that are happening almost before the team starts that impact the performance of the team. Particularly, found of note, 30% of how well a team eventually performs is determined by the initial launch of the team. So day one, right? 30% of the performance of a team over time is determined day one. How did we start? Where did we start? So when I like to, um, when I work with organisations about creating awesome tribes and we start with this idea of creating awesome teams, the question becomes how do we get to, how do we get to these teams? And, you know, the, the traditional approach is manager sits in their office with a spreadsheet and puts people into teams. Magic. Occasionally, they will work with other managers to collaborate on how they put people in the spreadsheets into teams. Occasionally, there is a whiteboard involved. Very agile. <laughs> I'm kind of fond of this thing called self-selection. Um, or squadification, as Sandy likes to call it. So, um, Sandy Mamoli, it's a Kiwi. We don't normally like Kiwis in Australia, but Sandy's all right. Well, she's not really a Kiwi, she's from Europe, she moved to New Zealand, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> so, uh, she, um, she's been doing this thing for a while that she calls self-selection or, or squadification, uh, whereby we take the structure of the organisation, the teams that we want to create, and we take those really smart people who do all the work and we say, why don't you decide where you want to work? Based on the premise that they're probably just as likely to get it right or wrong as anyone else. And people tend to feel a bit better about things when they're empowered to choose who they work with and potentially what they work on. So it's a facilitated process. Um, bring everybody into a, into a room, uh, we have a photo for every person, we have boards put up around the room for the various teams, we have product owners talk about the mission that their team would be responsible for and then we set a timer and we let people go and put their photo on the board of the team that they want to be a part of. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, stop the clock, see where we're at. Who still hasn't found a home? Which teams are too big? Which teams are too small? What needs to change? Go again. And we'll do that three or four times and either it'll settle or it won't. <laughs> Generally it does. Um, and if it doesn't, we work it out. The important thing is people got to make the choice around where they get to work. And it's not this lifelong commitment, it's the choice for now 
And when the organisation changes and for some reason we need to change the structure, we do it again. We have to make some changes. Where would you like to work now? For me, if you're trying to change the culture of an organisation, trying to implement Agile, move people into small teams, what a, what a really powerful statement about the change we're making. We're going from a world where we tell you what to do and who to work with to a world where you decide, you decide who to work with and what you'd like to walk, work on. Very, very powerful statement from leadership if you're leading a transformation. So once we have these awesome teams, we want them to do some agile stuff, um, visualise their work, huge fan of physical visualisations. They help create connection, people talking at a wall. It's a very different thing to have people talking in front of a computer screen. Daily communication, expect and adapt on cadence, and if you're in the software space, you want to be an awesome team, want to be an awesome agile team, you better do some extreme programming. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be in a world of pain. I've been there, trust me. So, if we have awesome teams, we now have the foundation for an awesome team of teams. Awesome team of teams, our tribe. So, we want to create connection again. So, we're still talking about connecting people. We've connected individuals into teams. We now need to create social fabric of the organisation, connection between the people on those teams. So, it starts with shared identity. Tribe needs a name, needs a reason for being, needs to know who they are. Uh, when I did this first time, those enterprise data warehouse folks, they had a really fancy name. They were the enterprise data warehouse agile release train. <laughs> Um, and all the teams had train names. So we had a, um, a maglev, which is a very fast train, a hyperloop, another very fast train. Um, we had a soul train, it's kind of cool. They wouldn't have a Thomas, I asked. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it's something a little bit more inventive. These guys are Shin Shinkansen which is Japan Japanese bullet train. Theme for their train is Japanese things. So we have a uh, Team Zen, Team Ninja, Team Sudoku. <laughs> shared identity. So shared identity, it's, um, it's really important to us as, as humans. We like to belong. Um, and if we don't feel we belong, our fight or flight reflexes kick in. So this is the same as, you know, again, football teams and sporting teams, colours and logos and what have you. It's very powerful in creating bond between people and helping people belong. When we name teams, I like to do this exercise called team product boxes. So you may have heard of the, the product visioning exercise where you create a box to, yep, okay. So the, the way this works is create a box that describes your team. If we were selling your team on a supermarket shelf, uh, what would the box say on it about the team? So again, bring those identities together. But what's fun about this is we get all of those teams to demonstrate their product boxes to each other. There's this thing that happens when people are vulnerable in front of each other that starts to build trust. So, very early in the tribe's life cycle, new teams, new identity, let's do something a little bit fun, a little bit silly, a little bit vulnerable, and start to create, create some bonds. T-shirts. T-shirts are awesome. Um, in Australia, when on our holidays we go to Bali, because it's close. Uh, when you go to Bali, if you're a good Australian, you buy t-shirts and you bring them home for your families and friends. When I went to Bali, I had a hundred Enterprise Data Warehouse t-shirts made and bought home for this gang. You can see the guy who left his t-shirt at home that day. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And um, you can also see there Meh, who did the weekend support. He's the skeleton looking dude. He was a mascot. So um, we also like to make, create shared experiences, create connection. One of the things that happens when you have lots of teams is those teams have a tendency to compete rather than collaborate. So shared experiences is one of the ways we create connection between teams. Many years ago, we created this idea of Unity Hour, um, originally called Unity Day, Unity Hour. This is the first hour of every sprint, first hour of every sprint. We bring everybody across the tribe together. And we play games and uh, get to know each other. Every single sprint, one hour, come together, get to know each other. I know it sounds a little bit strange, and I can tell you uh, when I was a business sponsor of groups like this, if my um, IT counterpart had suggested that he wanted to take the program off the floor for an hour a week to play games, uh, be fair to say I would have had a few words to say about that. And they probably wouldn't have been very nice words. Um, anyway, uh, so um, the idea is create connection. So agile learning games, aeroplanes. One of the tricks when you get people to play these games is don't leave them in their teams because you don't want to create competition. You want to use the opportunity to get people into different teams, networking with other people and creating new connections. Sometimes we'd have teams share what they've been working on during the course of the, the sprint. It's a Pictionary version. Um, raising money for charity. Really interesting way that this time would get used. Um, do you have Movember here? Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, it's Movember. Um, during Movember, we would have the parade of the Mo's. Uh, we would then dot vote for the person with the best Mo. Um, there was also an award for Miss Movember, uh, which you get for being unable to grow a moustache <laughs> in an entire month. <laughs> and of course there should be food. Has to be food. Um, this particular day, they have brought in a, a potluck lunch. Um, but, you know, it can just be someone stops and gets donuts on the way to the office. Doesn't need to be a big deal. You do not need a food budget. Uh, you just need to find the bakers in your team and be nice to them. This is how this works. <laughs> um, there's this funny thing that, that happens. I learned this from Linda Rising. She says, um, when, we, when we eat together, we let our defences down. So we trust people we eat with. So buy some donuts. Get them to eat together. Build relationships. So um, getting together once every couple of weeks is nice, but perhaps not enough. So another thing I like to do, we call cocktail hour. We like to drink a lot in Australia. <laughs> uh, cocktail hour is actually at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it does not involve alcohol, which is generally disappointing to people who come and visit. <laughs> Starts with a quick sync point between the leadership um, teams doing their stand-ups, and then at the, the bottom there, around 9.30, um, a scrum a scrum style thing. So uh, representation from all the teams talking about what's going on in their world um, and, and who needs help. This is the heartbeat of the organisation. So while every team has to be represented, anybody can turn up there. Um, a little photo there, probably only a tribe of five or six teams, but there's easily 20 to 30 people um, for that quick sync point every single day. Cascading stand-ups every single day. Uh, the guys that meet at uh, quarter to 10, the end of the, the hour, are teams that have support roles for the, for the core tribe. 
Um, if you're going to break people up into uh, mission-capable teams, you're going to go down the feature team path, uh, your specialists groups, your functional groups are going to get very, very nervous. What do you mean I can't have all the testers together in the testing group? How will they know how to be testers? <laughs> That's a whole different question. Um, <clears throat> so communities of practice are useful. Um, personally, fan of um, overlaying some of the thinking from Spotify. Um, obviously, I do a bit of safe stuff, but uh, we, um, I like to have chapters within my trains. So specialist groups, um, cross-cutting, feature teams to retain that sense of discipline around a function or a specialisation. And again, creating connections across the teams in the tribe in different directions. Um, it's important that if you want a tribe, you want them to be one team, when you celebrate, you treat them like one team. When you celebrate in your little units, you exclude everybody else in the tribe. So we want to celebrate as a tribe. These guys have um, epic cake. That's Smurf, very smiley guy. Um, epic cake, because they delivered an epic. It was for one of the teams or two of the teams. What, how do we do that? We share cake with all the teams. Birthdays are awesome. If you can have about 100 people in your tribe, you can have birthday cake twice a week, every week, all year. <laughs> you can have um, milestone cake, 50 iterations, 50 sprints. Maybe a party, bit of a foosball competition, or some um, we rock band in the office. You can even celebrate International Talk Like a Pirate Day, 19th of September. <laughs> it's a thing. I didn't know till he turned up dressed like that. <laughs> One of the things that's really important for me with these Unity Hours is the idea of a shout out, which is a, it's a thank you and appreciation. Um, getting people to stand up in front of their peers and go, thank, thank you, this person, for helping me figure out this problem last week, thank you this person for helping me deploy this thing on the weekend or, you know, whatever's going on. I've worked for a few, um, with a few groups that were too shy to stand up and say thank you. So they, uh, they would write notes and they would have tribe lead stand up and read the notes out. But whatever, right? This, this idea of, again, every single two weeks, say thank you, appreciate people, create the connections. So... We've connected people to one another. We really need to think about how we might connect those people to a leader. Go to the Gemba, the Japanese say. Leaders need to spend time in the real world talking to the real people about what's going on. Um, looking at people, well, walking around watching people staring at computer screens is perhaps not overly exciting. Uh, maybe if you have those physical visualizations I mentioned earlier, this can, this can help. Um, but if you're going to wander around, you might go and visit all the teams. I would call it walk the walls. What do you want the leaders to do? One question. How can I help you? Not what are you doing. That gets a whole different response, right? <laughs> How can I help you? How can I help you? What's going on? How can I help you? It's really interesting, the things that teams find completely insurmountable that the leader can fix. One that always stands out for me is a, a guy who says to me, I need more RAM for my computer. Okay. Why? Well, you know how we changed our um, standard software two months ago? Yes. It doesn't run on the standard machines. Okay. Um, what have you been doing for the last two months? I bought him my own laptop from home. He's hacked the corporate network. <laughs> because that was easier than getting more RAM for his computer. I can fix that. I can fix that. So, how can I help? Um, take what you learn to serve the tribe. 
make sure that you follow through. It doesn't work very well when you don't. Um, big fan of uh, leadership teams running as agile teams and um, taking ownership of the problems that are outside the control of the teams. Uh, be warned though. Most leadership teams are not very good agile teams. My continuous improvement wall got graffitied with sporadic improvement. In fairness, in a month, we didn't move a single card across the board. Um, another way you can uh, collect some of these impediments, um, it's a thing called a bubble up. So I like to get teams, that the, you know, everyone's um, doing their retrospective at the end of every sprint. And some things, team's going to fix. Some things, teams are going to take action against. Some things, teams can't fix, but they're talking about them. So we ask the teams to bubble up those issues and come together, send representatives together, end of every sprint, and bring the problems that are outside the team's control to leadership to put on their sporadic improvement board. <laughs> Hopefully, they um, get a little bit better at improving. But we've got to take those problems away, right? We take those problems away. Perhaps the most important thing a leader can do is show a little bit of vulnerability. Brene Brown, shame researcher, calls this the vulnerability paradox. Vulnerability is the last thing I want to, you to see in me and the first thing I look for in you. So I started this session with the Macarena. You may or may not have noticed I did not appear in the Macarena. Someone had to make sure that there was evidence, right? Yeah, see, some, some, some of you are with me, right? I mean, we needed video and photos. They'd enter, enter a competition. So um, one of the teams brought to bubble up that day that M did not do the Macarena. Yeah, awkward. Really, really awkward moment. Um, <laughs> so I said, don't worry, I've got it taken the cart, gone around to visit the team, said, um, I don't know how to do the Macarena. They said, yeah, we read this blog. I used to blog a lot about this team. I read this blog about the importance of leaders being vulnerable. <laughs> Another awkward moment. Um, so I um, decided to, to do, a, do a deal with them. I, um, I traded them for um, something we call at home the, the bus stop. Okay, it, it doesn't get any better. Um, <laughs> So um, at least some of you are going, there is no way on this earth my general manager is ever getting up and doing a bus stop in front of my team. Maybe. Maybe not. There's this, um, you know, we talk about the, the frozen middle. We talk about the, the fact that we can't get leaders to, to buy into our enterprise transformations. Have a theory. Have a theory. So Deming says, people are already doing their best. The problems are with the system. Pretty sure middle managers are people too. Pretty sure. And maybe the system doesn't lend itself very well to them doing the role we need them to do in these enterprise agile transformations. I'd like you to think about what that might be like. Someone comes down from above and says, you will make your organisation agile. Or teams start just going agile. I don't know about you folks, but uh, when I first learned about agile, I um, was a general manager, and this is what I learned. I'm a chicken. My job is to say nothing Interfere with nothing, talk to nobody. Be a chicken. So, you know, I can remember going to, to watching stand-ups. 
um, and going, oh, gee, they're in trouble. Could really, gee, they could probably do with some help. That was a chicken. Not allowed to talk. So, I'd like to suggest to you, if you think you're working for one of those managers that would never do any of this stuff, it's a two-way street. It's just as likely they're scared to interfere with you because they've been told not to as they don't want to. Invite them. If you want them to come and be part of your world, you want them to help, invite them. Invite them. Come to my wall. Come visit my team. Invite them. It's a two-way street. So final part of our message here from Seth Godin, connection to an idea. You know, I think we're, um, we all know it's important. Communicate the vision. John Cotter, Leading Change, says we under-communicate vision 10 to 100 times. Vision doesn't have to be grand though, right? We don't have to be putting people on the moon. Vision can be really, really simple. Just needs to be clear and communicated. When I um, took over that team, I started talking about the beginning of this session, we had a simple vision. World leaders in agile data warehousing. Definitely aspirational. <laughs> However, we had a vision. We put it on the back of our T-shirts. And that gave us something to strive towards. These days, I like to think about one team culture as a vision for an organisation. How do I, how do I take the culture of the organisation and get teams of teams to behave as one team, succeed and fail as one team. So how do we, how do we sustain this? Big fan of something called the Employee Net Promoter Score. You might be familiar with the Net Promoter Score or Net Promoter System, the ultimate question, would you recommend? On a scale of zero to ten, would you recommend product or service to a friend or colleague? Think about asking your tribe. On a scale from zero to ten, would you recommend working here to a friend or colleague? Just the act of asking the question will change the engagement with the people. Just the act of asking the question. Because you've now indicated that you care. This is cheap, this is easy. So I don't know, um, same in the US, but at home we have these employee engagement surveys. Employee satisfaction surveys, yep. So the, the way that works is they uh, send out a 70 question uh, survey to only the permanent staff uh, about once a year. Because, you know, consultants and contractors, not real people. You knew that, right? <laughs> it's very awkward. Um, <laughs> and then um, if you're the misfortune to be a manager, you get back a, a report like this. Someone says, fix it. Thank you. Uh, Survey Monkey, Google Forms. Two questions, takes one minute. Send it to everybody, contractors, consultants, permanent staff, doesn't matter. Would you recommend working here? Why did you say that? Take some 60 seconds to fill it out. Do it once every three months. Take action on the data. Your numbers will move. Your numbers will move. So all of this might look like a whole raft of forced fun. Really wasn't. It's really about creating an environment in which people feel safe to be the amazing people they already are at work. That's it. Create the environment where people feel safe to be who they are at work. These folks here took a day out of the office. They let Meh take over. Skelson in my seat there. Um, they had Ryan Gosling run the Scrum of Scrums. <laughs> uh, young Luke here, after um, not winning Movember, decided to go for Shave for a Cure. Said if we could raise $1,000, we could wax his legs. <laughs> and then one of the boys wanted a corner office. So um, you can see they're constructing a corner office for him, for him there. Yeah, you know, I often get told, you know, your story's M. Just wacky Australian stuff. They weren't all wacky Australians. Some of them were. Luke's from South Africa. <laughs> but there were people from all over. And it wasn't about being wacky Australians. 
It was about creating an environment where people felt safe. So um, I, I spent a couple of years with the EDW group that sort of started this journey for me. Um, and when I left, they made me a, a short feature film as a farewell present. So I'm going to show you a short clip from that film to give you a little bit of a flavour of what um, tribal unity might look like in an organisation. IR5869, feature 2034, we still haven't received something back. Okay, Jean. Okay. Bye. Bye. So, hey, no. Jean and I were just discussing how we can be a little bit more innovative in how we communicate. So, I want to try something different at the feature wall. Have a think about it, and we'll discuss it a little bit more. Ah. IR5869, feature 2034, we're still waiting for sample back. Mm, um, mm, I'm not quite sure that's what I was referring to, Wayne, but have another go. Okay, so um, what we found out in today's stand-up was there a few issues, defects, then we did a retrospective. Then we started working on it often. <laughs> that's how the disco's getting done. <laughs> Nailed it, Wayno. Nailed it. That's a good blog. I've got a blog. Megzy, got another blog. <laughs> so, um, it's one thing you, you need to take away from this. Uh, I, I don't know. What, what work, what's worked, what continues to work for me, might work for you, might not. But to um, take some words from Richard Sheridan. What I'd really like to do is inspire you to create an intentional culture of joy in your workplace. Want to know more about some of those stories? There is a wealth of material on my blog, which is prettyagile.com. Or please check out the book, Tribal Unity. Thank you very much for your time, folks.